Thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I actually did, I think, tweet right after I got accepted that it was accepted based, based on title alone. So hopefully I can, hopefully I can live up to that. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people have seen Black Mirror on Netflix? Okay, that's a good number. It's at least most people, I think, which is good because otherwise it, talk might fall a little flack. But it's okay if you haven't. Uh, I do highly recommend you do watch it. It's a great show. Just don't watch it right before you go to sleep. It's a little, a little creepy. Uh, what, what it does is it examines technology kind of taken to the next step or to the extreme. And, and when it does that, it shows kind of the negative impacts that that can have. But at its core, what it's really about is the innate flaws in humanity and how technology can kind of exacerbate that if we're not careful. Uh, and, and it uses our screens, right? These things that we have in front of us, our phones, that when they're off, they provide this very dark image of ourselves, right? They're this black mirror. Um, and, and it uses those screens and that technology, again, to shine a light and comment on some of our innate human, human flaws uh, that we need to be careful about as we go through technology. So for those who may not have seen that, I do want to run through a couple of examples, uh, but I swear I'll tie it back into DevOps. So first, in Nosedive, uh, we see the idea of ranking each other uh, in social media kind of lead to the loss of our humanity, right? We see this chasing uh, a number and a ranking, uh, ranking every interaction with each other as kind of not aligning us to the values that actually make for a good human being and, and not, you know, that don't make for a good person. Uh, those are not the same things that make for a great social media presence. Uh, Hated in the Nation takes the problem with uh, the loss of bees and says, oh, well, we could fix it with autonomous bee drones, right? Why not? That's great. Uh, and so automation for automation's sake can kind of be not a great thing. It could be weaponized easily. Uh, even if we have kind of an audacious, uh, braggadocious thought process that, ah, eh, this, you know, no one can ever hack this system. And it also shows us uh, people loving to vilify others from behind their computer screens and the, the anonymity that that provides. And then last, you know, there's a lot of other episodes that show, you know, when we institutionalize part of society as bad, uh, that can have some serious negative consequences. So this is White Bear, Men Against Fire, White Christmas. Uh, these all show that when we decide as a society that one thing is bad and another thing is good, uh, we can really exacerbate that with technology uh, in a way that we don't intend. So these kind of seem like horror stories, but they also seem to be just a minute away from where we are right now. And so in thinking about that, you know, I was thinking about, you know, this is really about applying technology in the right way. And I think that's what we as DevOps practitioners try to do every day. And so I said, what about our world? What about DevOps? And I said, you know, season four just came out uh, a month or two ago uh, on Netflix. And I said, well, what if they, the Netflix writers decided to make season five about DevOps? What would that look, at, look like? And so I've got six episodes of season five to talk about. Uh, and the interesting thing is episodes one through three have actually already been released. Uh, they're things that have happened already. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. The first is the Equifax breach. Pr pretty much everyone in the room knows about that. Uh, if you don't, it was 146 million people whose social security number uh, and date of birth were leaked. Uh, that includes myself, my wife, uh, and three of my four children, uh, the fourth, she was safe only because she wasn't born and didn't have a social security number when the breach happened. Uh, so she, she's cool, but the rest of us, we were part of this breach. Uh, and how did it happen? Well, Equifax had a piece of open source software, Apache Struts. A lot of us use Apache products or, or I mean, uh, salt open source libraries. Uh, and there was a major vulnerability released. And it was patched by Apache within about three days uh, of it being released. But Equifax left this in their production environment for over a year. And people had, you know, full reign, the hackers that uh, perpetrated this had full reign over their environment for over a year. And then once the light was shined on them, Krebs on Security actually then found that their Argentinian employee site had admin admin as a login. So, <laughs> so again, once, once that light's kind of shown on you, there's, there's lots of places that you can break down. And, and some of us, you know, we can, we can look at Equifax and say, well, that's not us. Um, you know, we have a plan in place. But Meltdown Inspector 
takes that plan off the table, right? And there's going to be a talk tomorrow um, by Barbara, who I haven't met, but she's here somewhere. She's talking tomorrow about Meltdown Inspector uh, in detail. Um, and she was supposed to, we were supposed to go the other order, so I was going to have all that. <laughs> but just if you don't know what that was, a quick summary. Uh, basically, you know, a processor, processors got so fast that we decided uh, instead of waiting to figure out if A or B is going to be true, we'll just run trains down both tracks. And, and then whichever one that ends up being true, we take and we throw away the other train. Uh, the problem with this being it allowed other applications running on the same processor as us to hijack that second train that wasn't going to be used and actually read the memory of our applications, uh, which is really bad thing. That's the one thing we don't think about. We think about data at rest and we think about uh, data in transit, but we don't think about the actual memory of our applications, most of us, uh, that program in a modern programming language. And so that's, that's, that's a really bad thing. And this XKCD, I think, summarizes it really well. It's probably impossible to read. Um, but my favorite part of it says, do we just suck at computers? And she says, yep, especially shared ones. And then the third episode uh, is Knight Capital. So if you don't know about Knight Capital, this is talked about in a lot of DevOps circles. Uh, Knight Capital lost $440 million in a day. Uh, and in a day, actually, I mean in 45 minutes. Uh, that's two times their quarterly revenue at the time. And, and how did this, and, or, or $10 million a minute, um, and so, so how did this happen? Well, when they looked at what happened, uh, what happened was there was a manual deployed to production of new trading software. And the person that manually deployed that software put it on seven production servers. Problem is they have eight production servers. And so with, at first, when, when trading opened that day, everyone knew something was wrong just because of the volume of trades that Knight was doing. Uh, but they didn't have a kill switch. They couldn't kill it. And so as they're scrambling to figure out what's going on, they actually said, well, we just updated. Let's roll back. So they roll back the update so that only the broken code was in production, none of the working code, and actually made it worse. So uh, yeah, that's, that's not great. So again, those are three episodes that have happened already uh, and, and do show us you know, what, what can go wrong when we, when we are arrogant about uh, our, our pipelines. Uh, but there's four other episodes I want to talk about um, that I think could be, we could just be a minute away from if we're not careful. Uh, episode four I call the illusion of safety. So we open on a playground. A dad is watching his kids play. As I mentioned, I have four, so I'm, I'm familiar with this. Uh, he's, he's watching them. He laughs as they're, they're running around. Suddenly his phone rings. He looks at the phone, and he sees who it is, and he puts it right back down in his pocket. Uh, but as soon as it touches his pocket, it starts ringing again. And as he picks up the phone, uh, everything around him fades to black. Uh, we, have, we, we see that he's not in the park at all. He's in the office on Sunday. Uh, he's trying to figure out uh, what parts of their infrastructure are impacted by a huge security breach, a security uh, issue that was discovered on Friday. And he doesn't know what's impacted and what's not. And his boss is calling him, trying to figure out, hey, are we protected from this thing I'm, I'm hearing about in the news? because uh, his boss doesn't want a phone call from Congress to come testify uh, why they left this, this uh, vulnerable thing in their system for so long. Episode five, I call Sisyphean development, which was a dangerous word to put in a presentation because I had to say it, but that's okay. Uh, so in, in this one, you know, the fixes and the features that a customer wants, they're done. They've been coded. Uh, they've been done for weeks, but we keep going back over and over, trying to integrate them, in meeting after meeting after meeting, trying to figure out what's wrong, why it doesn't integrate, why this other code broke the code that this customer needs. Uh, and Molly wakes up every morning, hears her alarm, and hits it, knowing that you know, she just kind of grunts disapprovingly because she knows it's going to be another Groundhog Day of Scrum meetings that really don't solve the, the core problem of, of being able to integrate this code. In the last episode, I call episode six, superhero or tax collector. So in this episode, Ned is awake before his alarm. The need for his superpowers awaken him from even the deepest slumber. He, can, he puts on his cape, uh, he puts on the rest of his suit, he goes into work. At work, everyone knows that he's a superhero, and he knows it. He's got a tool for every problem. Uh, he, every problem that comes up, you know, Ned knows what tool to put onto that and fix it. But in reality, that's not how his co colleagues see him. They see him as a tax collector. They see him as every time there's a new problem, there's some tool that we have to go buy, 
spend money to integrate, uh, and, and, and takes actually longer in the end to deliver on software. So they don't see him as a, as a superhero, they see him as a tax collector. But it's not too late. Uh, I do believe that it doesn't have to be this way, and that actually we are all uniquely positioned to make it not be this way as DevOps professionals, right? We've been given this gift to see these kinds of problems. We've seen other people have them and fall on their face. We've, we've, we know that innately these things can happen. Uh, but that gives us the chance to make a better future for us, for our development colleagues, and for our customers. And so there's some solutions to these problems that I want to talk about next, right? Um, I think all of these things boil down to avoiding the DevOps tax. We don't want to be seen as just a cost center to the business. We want to be seen as a strategic advantage to the business. Uh, and DevOps, when it was first coined, was seen as exactly that. But in practice, it, it isn't always that way. And so, and so how do we make it that way? Well, first of all, I think we have to take responsibility for it. I think that's the most critical thing. Uh, we are the DevOps professionals in this room. That's why we're here. That's why we came to this conference. Uh, we have to be the change that we seek in our organizations uh, to, to drive this home. And so again, that sounds really great, but the next question I would have if I were you is, Brendan, what can I do today? So I want to dive into a couple of things uh, that we can go back and do today. Well, not today, not tomorrow. I would have said Friday, but anyway, Monday. What can you do Monday? Take the weekend. But then Monday, what can you do to, to improve uh, how we deliver software? And the first one I'm going to talk about is not interfacing with things like security. Uh, security should not be at the end of the pipeline. It shouldn't be something we interface with. It should be integrated into the entire pipeline. Uh, we also don't want to let our organizations think of DevOps as just automated builds, right? That is not DevOps, and we'll, and we'll talk about why. DevOps should enable development teams to move as fast as possible uh, from getting ideas all the way from the business concept into production environments. And in order to do that well, uh, we've heard a couple talks about it today, uh, I think we'll hear more, but we have to orchestrate monitoring in the beginning uh, and, and into all of our, our software pipelines. So first, one was security. My wife told me I could not present at a tech conference and not have a Star Wars reference. So I got Star Wars and a meme in one. Uh, it's a two-for-one deal. What does this mean? Uh, I think it means we need to shift left what we're doing with security. Right? Security cannot be at the end of what we're doing in an afterthought. It has to be every commit, every time. Uh, in order to do that, it has to be automated. And when we do that, it becomes not a burden on teams. Today, it's a burden. People say, oh, you know, well, yeah, we got to do security before the end of the release, and we're going to run, run the security tests, and it's going to come back with 150 things, and then we're going to have this horrible choice of, well, do we accept the risk of these 150 possible security issues? Uh, some of them are probably, probably false positives, maybe I don't care about them. Uh, or do I delay the release to the customer? Um, and so if we're, if we're not bringing security into the pipeline in the beginning and shifting it to the left in our pipelines, uh, we're, we're making it a burden uh, on our teams. And high-performing teams get this. And yes, I'm from GitLab, and yes, I put a Git joke in it, uh, which everyone that works at GitLab told me not to keep in, but I kept it in, so. Now you know how hard-headed I am. Uh, so, but, it, but it's true. There was a survey done, uh, and we've got some more data on the next slide, that shows that high-performing teams spend 50% less time remediating security issues than their lower-performing counterparts. And along with that, they have almost 30% more automated tests. Uh, and so if we want to build high-performing teams, which I think is what we all want to do uh, in, in, this, in this industry, we have to embrace this. And why is it so important? Well, in the same survey, uh, and this graph may be hard to read, uh, it's been iterated on a number of times, but I'll, I'll tell you what it says, it's okay. Uh, in a survey of security professionals that had experienced a penetration attack to their environment, uh, they were asked how was the attack performed? And the top two bars there, the top is software vulnerability, and the second bar is a, a web vulnerability, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, that kind of stuff. Uh, so those are the top two ways actual attacks in the wild are being performed. Uh, and things that we think about or maybe make the news a little bit more, like denial of service. Denial of service is, see, I can't even read it. Denial of service is fourth. And phishing attack is actually the, 
the second to last, and then all others as the last bar. Uh, so those are the attacks that get a lot of um, attention because I think they kind of speak to, you know, a, a, a gloomier worldview of, of uh, what an attacker does. Uh, but how they are really carried out is through sulfur and vulnerabilities. And, and so based on that, what should have Equifax looked like, right? What, what, why was it possible for them to have this issue in production for almost a year? Well, if we truly automate the entire software development lifecycle and shift security left, it's so much simpler. Uh, it's not a hard problem to solve then. So instead of a manual alert to someone, which someone at Equifax did get, and did not tell the right people about. Uh, instead of a manual alert about some CVE that came out or having to re read through every CVE myself, uh, your, your software pipeline should know what libraries and open source libraries you're using. And based on that, it should also then look at what vulnerabilities come out. And if it knows that you use Apache Struts 1.2.5 and it sees a vulnerability come out and says, okay, there's now 1.2.6, it should automatically create a merge request for that, put it into testing. If we test, if we care in, enough about our tests, uh, then it should be able to test and put that into prod. And instead of waking up to an email of 17 CVs that came out over the weekend, uh, if we could all go to we could all go to happy hour tonight, go to bed. Some major Apache thing gets released over overnight. It was let's say it was it was a white hat hacker that found it, so the patch is immediate to them announcing the vulnerability. Instead of waking up to an email about the vulnerability and our boss is calling us because they saw on CNN this morning this huge vulnerability that exists, we wake up to an email that says, oh, your production system's already patched. Right? That's what it should be. That's what it should look like. So that's security. Uh, next, automated builds are not CI, CD. Uh, and I think I, my fellow speakers have kind of stressed this, enough, stressed this as well. Uh, but I also translated it into a number of languages here to make it very clear. Uh, so the, the C part of continuous integration and continuous delivery is often lost, right? What's the C stand for? Continuous, right? That means we have to integrate code early and often in the process. And to do that, again, we have to care about our tests and care about test passing, right? It's not okay to have flaky tests because then the human be our, our human minds will just write off all the tests we've written and, and not care about them. And then the D in, in CD, you know, some people say it's delivery, some people say it's deployment. I think it's both. I think it's critical that we care about delivery and have automated packaging and automated release processes. If we don't have that, we're not gonna be able to release fast enough. We cannot have manual steps in that process. And I think, again, to do continuous deployment, automated deployment is obviously required. And we, and we saw an example of that in the last talk uh, there's lots of different ways to do that, but I think it's a requirement because in order to move at the speed of our developers uh, and, and the speed the developers are able to deliver code, we have to be able to deploy it into production automatically. And then uh, last is uh, data is the new testing. So uh, I also had to get a Mean Girls reference in there. Um, so now you, you all have fully met me. Um, <laughs> and, and so I took, I took the, uh, the, the old, old adage, what is... Uh, what is measured can be improved. And I said, no, 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 what, what is monitored can be improved, right? Uh, the SDLC, right, we say SDLC a lot, it's a life cycle. Again, don't lose that life cycle part of it. It does not have an end. And, and because of that, monitoring has to be part of the plan from the beginning. And if it's not, we've already lost, right? When monitoring is part of the plan and we have automated deploy and continuous deployment, now we can easily ship Canary into production see how something works, iterate on it, on it much faster, see how it operates in an actual production environment with actual customers using our code. Um, and that really allows us to ship what we the way we want to ship, which is ship the minimally viable change every time uh, so that we can, we can really uh, accelerate delivery into production. So, uh, you know, again, I, I, I'm acutely aware, because this is the first startup I've worked for uh, at GitLab, that, that sometimes when a GitLab person or, or someone from a startup gets on stage, uh, someone might say, yeah, that's great, Brendan, that's great for startups, but, but not in my industry. Uh, and, and around here, I think that's especially true, right? The federal government, uh, we all think, oh, they don't move fast enough, so not in my industry. But I think that's, that's dangerous. Uh, and I think time has shown us how dangerous that can be, right? Let's think about very traditional industries that 
that probably felt that way. Oh, we, we're not ripe for disruption, right? Transportation, transportation, very old industry, uh, but was hugely disrupted by Tesla entering the market and even more so by ride sharing uh, platforms entering the market. Uh, something even more basic like healthcare has been incredibly disrupted by Amazon deciding to enter that market and what CVS has done. Even more basic than healthcare is groceries, right? Basic human need. Uh, and again, Amazon hugely disrupted that market by buying Whole Foods. And then just stuff, right? Internet of Things means that everything uh, is ripe for disruption. So just things and stuff. And, and thus your industry, despite what anyone tells you. Uh, and I just want to look at Amazon again for a second. So this, uh, to prove the point, are the major healthcare providers in this country with their stock prices rebased to the time that Amazon announced they were entering the market uh, with healthcare. And so you can see the immediate impact that them just announcing it, they don't even have anything all together yet, but Amazon announcing their entry uh, and what that did to, to shareholder value, uh, value for, for those healthcare companies. And so again, your industry is ripe for this no matter what, uh, what you say. Uh, and if you say, yeah, Brendan, I get it, I get it, but uh, my boss doesn't get it. You know, I think, again, it's important to remember that we are the DevOps professionals, and we need to make that our problem, right? We need to be able to explain better uh, to our leadership uh, why this is a problem and why they need to care about it for the business. Uh, and, and that, again, take the responsibility on ourselves. Uh, and then uh, just kind of lastly, uh, I think it's critical to know that everyone can contribute. I think it's critical uh, to acknowledge that we need to not build silos between different departments, right? That's the original idea behind putting the two words development and operations together into DevOps. Uh, and it's something that really uh, hasn't been fully realized yet, uh, but we have the ability to realize that if we, if we build bridges instead of silos. Uh, and, and that will allow us to put customer value first and allow us not to let perfect get in the way of good or perfect get in the way of shipped, right? And, uh, oh, one other thing I had to mention because I said I would mention it on Twitter, um, which is someone came up with a bunch of caveman Black Mirror episodes, which I loved. Um, so this is kind of the opposite thing. And my favorite is, what a fire, but too much. <sighs> so I could go on uh, forever and ever about DevOps, uh, trust me. Uh, and so feel free to find me at the conference. I'd love to meet as many of you as I can. Um, but if I could, if, if you could take one thing away from this talk, I think it should be shift left, right? If we take, if we take our pipelines and move everything we're doing at the end and move it a little bit to the left and continue to force things left, uh, it will allow us to, you know, take control of the process from end to end, the original goal of DevOps. And, and really allow us to control our own destiny. Uh, and when you're interacting with your boss, your boss's boss, your colleagues, uh, your peers, uh, you should do that. Uh, and you should choose to use your DevOps powers for good. Uh, and when we do that, I think we build a, a better future for ourselves, a better future for our teams together, and a better future for our world. Thank you. <laughs>